just to explain you what we are going to do. So here is for VCP device, virtual COM port. Okay, so I already have a couple of words. It's just to see uh, the USB connection as a UART connection. So you can receive and send data. It's usually used by many, many people just to get out some traces from USB or get some information. It's quite easy to use. Um, so there is a lot of VCP terminal application for PC. Okay, not plug and play supports, no measures, see. Okay, here the purpose will be just to do some a look back example. I mean that when we finished, we should connect our STM32 to the PC. You will see it as a COM port. Then we will use some terminal emulators and we send data and the device will send it back. This is the purpose of this training. So first, we will create a new project under CubeMX. So let's do it together. So new project. Mm. And then we will select our chip. So here, you can just put F446ZE, for example. Oh, sorry. Uh, I mean caps lock. F uh, four four six said. You can see the list, and here you've got the one with your nucleo. Okay, so I will just double click this. First, we will go in the pinout tabs. So that means we will define which peripheral we want to use. For sure. What we want to use is, at the end, USB, OTG, full speed, or high speed. I propose for this training, we'll do, okay, I want to activate, and I will be a device only. Okay, so just go on the USB, OTG, full speed, and say, okay, I want to be a device. As soon as I've done this, you can see here, the two pins are booked. Or I will say are reserved. That means now we have configured on these two, two pins, the data plus and the data minus are just configured on those pins. Okay, so now what we've got, so you remember, we've got some constraint about uh, clocking. We need to have an accurate clock uh, to, be, to be able to communicate in USB. In this case, we don't have internal oscillators who could answer this. We need an external one. On this board, on this Nucleo, if you check the user manual, uh, I won't do it for you, um, there is no external clock. But there is a link to the other chip. You can see on the board there is two chips. The big one is this F446, is the one that we are targeting. But on the upper part here, there is another STM32. This one is what we call the ST-Link. It's another STM32 that we use for debugging, downloading code, and such kind of things. It's a way to communicate with our target. And this one, I've got an external oscillators, and just go out the clock through the pen, and it could be selected and enter in the other one. So, we know that the clocking is coming by one pen, but we have to configure it in our pinout. So there's... I will go uppers, and I will go in the uh, CC. And I say, OK, now the HSU, it's a bypass clock source. It's not a, if I put crystal ceramic oscillators, that means we really have uh, an oscillators, and we have to drive it. Here, we just receive a signal, already a clock source, and it will book the right pin. OK, so now you should have the USB there, so clocking that will be used as an input, we will configure it after, that is configured. And now, this is, I would say, the peripheral that we will use, but you can see that from the middleware point of view, we can do some configuration. On we activate a device, and now we can select the class of the device. Here you've got the different possible an audio device. It could be a communication device class, virtual comport. we are interested. DFU, 
download firmware update class, human interface class, custom human interface class, and mass storage. So here we decided what kind of class will be supported by our target. During this exercise, we will use the virtual COM port, so communication device class. If you miss something during this training, you've got the slide, okay, uh, labs one, it was a lab.pdf, you've got all the information there and many more. So now we have prepared, I will say, our pinout. We are happy with this, but you can see something wrong there. <laughs> there is some red. And the problem is that now we have to configure, I will say, the cloaking. So here, just click on it. You say, okay, there is something, can I run it automatically? Just answer no for the moment. And what's happened, don't be afraid by this, it just show you all the clock tree of our device. So on the left side, you've got the input external. You've got the possible low speed external oscillators, the high speed external oscillators, and here we've got the input frequency. We have to correct this value. I said that we've got an oscillator on the ST link part, who is, I would say, propagated the signal to the other one, but this one is at 8 MHz. So we are just to correct the value and say this one is an 8 MHz crystal. It's okay for you? Just change the input frequency just there. I just switch to clock configuration. Say that you don't want it solved by himself, the issue and then put the input frequency to 8 MHz. The first hands-on is really, I will say, the way that we will work. After, we will skip this part because it's always the same, because it's just a basic configuration. So then now we say, okay, we will use the external crystal. Okay, and then I can decide what is the system clock, at which speed I want to go. For us, we will go to 168. And if I'm doing that, I'm just doing an enters, and suddenly it's searching a solution. That means it compute what is the different coefficient in the PLL to achieve this solution. Oh, sorry. I, I've got this kind of windows. Say, do you want a new source? Okay. And he found out what are the configuration to have here the USB to 48 MHz. The system clock is 168. And we've got the HSA. Okay? That show you which configuration you should achieve. So any question on this? No, nobody wants to achieve the 180 megahertz. Because commonly guys say, but why 168? Why not the 180 zero? We can indulge this, but for this, we should have to choose another PLL for the USB. So it will be another one. We can do it, but it's just an additional PLL for just some megahertz. So we prefer to have just one PLL activated there, just to avoid another consumption. On this 168 is enough for what we are doing together. It's okay. So now we have done the pinout. We have done the um, clocking. Now let's go to configuration. In fact, we won't do many things there, but I want just for you to have a look. So in this, you can configure the different things. So you can configure, for example, the interrupt priority of such kind of thing. I just give you an overview for those who don't know uh, this, uh, this tool. You can do some DMA configuration. For the full speed, as you can see, you can do some modification. The on-point mic size, if I enable the internal uh, IP DMA, it's not available on this device, but it could be. Some low power, they be sensing on start of frame. You can say, okay, I want to generate um, the signal start of frame on one pin. For example, you've got your device and you want to generate 
a signal, start of frame on the pin of your device for clocking anything else, I don't know. And you will have something with one millisecond, very useful for another driving. That's a possibility. We won't use it there. Um, from the USB device point of view, here you've got some things you know. It's linked to the descriptors. You've got some number of interface, numbers of configuration. You've got the device constructor that you can modify. In fact, the PID that have been chosen will make that it will be detected by a VCP. So don't modify it. But if you develop your own product and you've got your PID, you can set it there and it will be set in the code generated. We'll see after. So just to show you that you can do some configuration of your device. Here we don't do anything. So we are happy with it. Okay. And now we will generate. So first we will configure so it was project settings, and we will configure where we will generate, what kind of things, and how it should be involved. So our first name, so maybe I do many and so on. Um, let's do it another way. So I let you decide what to put it on. Yeah. USB training up and so on. Milano. Ah, yes. Milano. So I just it. And let's call it, for example, CDC device. So we check the name. Where we will, I will say, generate it. The toolchain folder, don't keep it. And then you can choose which IDE you want to generate for. So you can use scale, True Studio, AC6, make file or the tool chain, you want for sure. But today we will handle this thanks to Studio. Then you can do the linker settings to design the heap and the stack. Here please increase the size to 600 for the heap. This will be needed to support this profile. This is something that's very important. You have to uh, ensure that your hip size is correct for all profile and depending on which one you are using. You will see that for other hands-on, sometimes we go to 2000. Because we will, the stack USB will allocate huge structures depending on which profile you are using. For the VCP, it will need some data and things like that. So it's something that's really crucial to know what kind of hip I should put there. Is it okay for everybody? Just doing this setup? I will just, for the cultures, give you all the option that is possible. Um, here, it's where is put your CubeMX firmware. I don't, I don't know if you remember, you have used it CubeMX, but CubeMX using another resources with the CubeMX firmware. The CubeMX firmware is embedded all the stacks, uh, all the example of library and such kind of things, but it also embedded some a code example that you can go and have a look in it. You know this or not? Okay, uh, maybe I will have a couple of words off on this for those who don't know. But it just in this CubeMX firmware, just have a look with, uh, fi um, with uh, file explorers and have a look what you've got at this location. You will find many information. You can find the library, but you can also find many examples that have been written for USB and for all the IPs of our product. So it could be really useful when you have to deal with even the RAT or DNA. You've got some code example there. So about code generators. So here we've got different options. I won't go in it right now. Copy the necessary file, advanced setting. Okay. Just for your information and those who don't know, um, in our library, we've got different level of extraction. We've got the HL. So HL, it's uh, layers that allow you to do some, to the use of IP without knowing anything about register and things like that. Okay. 
that could make you unhappy for sure if you are used to use um, the, um, directly the registers so or you don't know what is behind, but it's working fine very quickly. The code size is not very good because it addresses every case of error and such kind of things. And sometimes there is bugs for sure. But we also deliver another library which is low level, which is closer than the, to the registers. So that allows you to have a code that is less readable, maybe, um, less understand understandable at the first look, but closer to the register. And it will be quicker on the size, uh, not quicker, sorry, it's smaller on the size. So here we can say for each device, I want to be generated in low layer or HL layer. For the USB, you don't have the choice because it's so much complicated. It's plugged on the HL, you can't use directly the registers. But just to let you know that if you feel uncomfortable with this level of abstraction, you can still switch from one to another one. Okay, so come back to the project. If you set the name, the True Studio, change the hip size to 600. Just say OK. And then here we've got the button generate the code. So this time, it will take all the information you, you get there. So it will get some template hidden in the firmware. Copy everything at the good place. Here we've got the button uh, open project. Don't use it, please, for Atolic. For Atolic, we'll have to import it in Atolic to, to ensure it's working fine. This button can be used with higher on Kyle without problem. But for Atolics, I will recommend just to say, OK, close for the moment. Everybody managed to generate? Or I go too quickly? The generate button is just there. Or you can do project generate code. So now I will show you what I generate for sure. Um, so here I was in the USB training on the Milano. On here we can find what have been generated. This is really where you find IOC file is the CubeMX configuration you have done. That means what everything we have done is just in this IO file. What you can see around is just the code that have been generating for Atolic. Um, I will just have a quick look in the queue. Not needed. Let's let's launch Atolic right now. Okay. Just do. Okay. Sorry about that. I will close my old project. Um, let's remove it. So, when you load Chatolik, you should be in this configuration. I will say nothing, no project at all. Everybody got this? That means you managed to load Chatolik. No? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> it takes time for the first load. Um, so, I won't address how to use Chatolik. Uh, we will just compile, just debug a little bit. So, it's it's not so tricky to use, it's just an environment like another one. So, But it's really interesting tools. Um, from my point of view, really better than RC6. But it's really personal, that's depending. Some of guys prefer RC6 also. Um, I also like higher for personally. But this one is really a good solution. Yeah, so I like it. <laughs> Yes, many people, because it's, if you know how to use SSX, you know how to use this one. And this one, I've got some debugging feature more advanced or more easy from my point of view. But this is really personal. I mean, if you are used to Atelic for many years, maybe you are more familiar with it. So it's up to you. OK, so everybody managed to load SSX? OK. So we will import our project. So for this, it's file and import. Then we will import from general existing project file into workspace. So you have seen it proposes you to create a workspace. 
So sometimes you are like, what is this workspace? I will say it's where it will put uh, some dynamic content generated or things like that. Don't worry with it, it's just hidden. And you will see that you can delete a project inside Atolic, but it's not delete your sources, it just delete, I will say, configuration on code generated, that's all. Don't be afraid with this. It's a little bit confusing when you start it, but after you will forget it and it's very useful. So just import. Select the root directory, that means where you have generated your code. So here, just in my code. USB training, hands on Milano. I just take the roots, folders, and here it just proposed me do you want to import this one at this location? I will just say finish. Then you can see here the project that is coming. It's okay for everybody? We just import our first project. Okay, just check that I don't forget anything. So now we'll have a closer look of what is the code generated. Here we've got the sources. I would say it's where is your code, or I mean the code that is generated for you and is in the user space. And we've got the middleware from ST with a USB library. Here we will have got a core and the class. The class is for the CDC, I would say. On the core, it's just, I would say, the core uh, generic for the USB. So mainly this one will text, and if it's for the CDC, it will send information to this one. We'll come back later on all the details of this stack, just to give you some, I would say, point of view where we are. Here you can see that in our part, we've got some USB device, USB CDC interfaces, USB conf, and USB descriptors. Other things that we are using, as I said, is the different drivers, so the HL drivers. So it's our abstraction layers that will interface with the registers and just uppers. But for the first hands-on, the purpose will be just to use it on not understanding any everything, I would say, on our stack, and we will come back after. So. We would like to know how to send and receive data over VCP. So this function, it will be handled in the operation in the generated CDC interface fail, file. Sorry, There is some callback function, which is a CDC control. So if you spy the buses, you can't just plug it, detect it as a, as a VCP, and just send data or receive data. Windows, and this is really dri dri the drivers in Windows, will request to set the configuration of the line, the board rate, such kind of thing. So Windows send you this configuration. You have to send it or send yours if you want to be able to discuss. This is really, uh, I would say, uh, standard tricky with the VCP on Windows. We've got requests in the past, not handled by me, but my colleague Lubos. So guys say, okay, I'm using just a VCP connection with Windows. I can see the traffic on the line, but I don't receive anything. I don't catch. And just by looking um, with the debuggers, so we, I, you don't see the traffic on the line, you see that the Windows request, okay, what is the configuration of the line? And if the device don't answer this request, it don't accept to have packets. You don't manage to open your ports, okay? So we will need to, to do this in our, in our end zone. It's to send back just the configuration to the host of the VCP line. Then, um, so this will be done in the CDC control files uh, FS uh, function. Um, and then the receive callbacks, so we will go in still in the interfaces. We can do in this function receive callback. We'll see where we receive packet. And what we will insert this is just the send back of the value that we receive. So here, in two slides, I just sum up what are the next steps. First, we need to loop back the configuration to Windows, and then we'll just loop back the characters that we receive. 
let's come back to our code. And so we are on AFE6. Okay, you got it. So here, we, let's go in the interfaces. Sorry for that, just increase. So here you've got the interfaces that are available in it. You've got some init, the init control, receive, and you've got some then. So here we go in the control files, and you've got the line coding. It's exactly what I explained to you. We will receive some uh, get line coding from the, from, the, from the host, and we have to send it back to, to uh, Windows. So here we just, it's an array of seven bits, seven bytes, sorry. So we just create a buffer of seven bytes and just take the value we receive and send it back to Windows. It's okay for you? So let's do it together. So, okay, just for your information, in the code generated, you can see many comments and you've got some user code begin, user code end. Whatever the code you are putting between such kind of tags, user code begin, user code end, it will be preserved if you regenerate it again with kubemx. You remember, we do the configuration of the pin, we do the configuration of the clocking, we generate the code. Now we will add it our own code. If you don't put it behind, between sorry, those both, if you regenerate your code, you will lose your modification. So let's put the code at the right place just to ensure that if we regenerate again this uh, project, it will be well under. Okay. Okay, so not private micro, private type, private variable. It looks good. Int. I don't see my screen. The, the, the type. Refer of seven. So we just declare this value declare this unit buffer of seven and then we'll go with my mouth sorry for that okay so now we come back on the control and when we receive the set line coding uh, we will just memorize what is sent by windows go back on this control so you can see we receive the p buffers, okay? So we'll take the information in the p buffer, put it in our temporary buffers, and then we will set it back when needed. So here, on the set line, okay. So in the set line, we will memorize what have been received. So it was just our buffers. Yeah, and let's do it this for the five byte. should have a marrow. <laughs> oh. It was just seven for sure. Two three four. Oh I missed one, sorry. Five. The five. Okay. 
So first we have to memorize it when we receive a set coding from Windows. And we will just send it back. That means we will need to do the symmetric one. So no sort of clever. It's okay for everybody? So here, we just receive a configuration from Windows and return back. And doing this, we ensure that the communication will work. We could see this with a USB analyzer after this communication between the both. So now we've got the configuration okay. We know where we receive it, where we receive the characters. You can look in the files that you are open, the interfaces. You have something that is received. And in this function, we will add it just the loop back. That means we just say, OK, I'm ready to send something. So you have found the function that uh, should receive by your own. Not so complicated. Oh, the receive FS. So I think it's a good candidate. Here we can say that there is set Rx buffers and receive data. So now let's take this data that have been received and send it back. So, how we should transmit it? Uh, the answer is just below. <laughs> so, we just take this function. Okay. We just had it this. What are the protocol? The buff and the lens. We receive a buff and the lens. So, not so much complicated also. Just take the buffer. and just take the lens that we want to attend. OK, so we have done the configuration. Here we just installed the loop back. That means as soon as we receive something, we just send it back to the PC. So when we will open our virtual COM port, and when we strike a, a we should have an A that's come back on the screen. And to build, you just select the project, use this button, or right-click and just build the project. And in the console, you should have the traces. Here, yeah, I already compiled, so I have nothing. And then, let's plug our boards. Already down on my side. So, the USB, so the the nuclear have two connectors. The one who we use for the debugging is the one of the ST-Link. So it will be the one on the top with a little STM32. OK, so let's connect first this one. The connector that is down is just our the one that we just configured. Our VCP will come thanks this port. OK, so just plug it in your PC. And I hope the driver I installed and should work. When you plug, you should have this microcontroller installing virtual COM port. So that means you are able to, co to, I will say, communicate with the ST-Link. So here we are ready to, I will say, download our code. So for that, you can just uh, right click and do debug as embedded application. <coughs> Doing this, it will flash your code, open the debugging link, and just stop on the main. Oh, sorry, I missed it. Debug as OK. And you will see that it will switch to another view. So it's something 
proper to atolic or AC6, you've got a view for debugging and a view for uh, development. So we just switch from one to another. We can see the debug, it says where it stops. You are just at the beginning of the code and then everything is ready. So then you can just start the code. So now we've got, I will say, a VCP ready on the targets. So let's try to use it. So if you've launched the code, now you can plug your second cable from the lower connectors to Windows. Because now we will connect our device. He's ready, he's running. Uh, we've got the password. Let's just try to plug it and see what's happened. Just to, let's keep this Windows. I will do it on my side. So if I just plug it, on my side, what's happened? I see a new virtual COM port appear there. The first one was the ST-Link one, and this one is the one that we've created together. The number is probably not the same for you. You can just use any uh, UART, uh, port emulator you've got in your PC. If you don't have, there is one in the material that we provided to you, Kermit and just open this link 81 so I use the com port and here at the port and just set the board rate by default is 155-200 okay and on my side as soon as I send a zero a uh, 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 letters you can see it on the screen. It's not a local echo. I mean, if I unplug my board, if I hit my keyboard, there is nothing. If I unplug it again, so I have to reopen the port. So, as Lubo told me, avoid doing some plug unplug of the, um, uh, the, the virtual COM port because uh, there is issue that you have difficulties with the uh, softwares that will reopen the ports. So I have to switch it off, plug it again, switch it on uh, before it detect again the good ports. If we go back in the uh, interfaces, it's not a good idea that it will stop the execution, so it will be unstable after, but it just to show you where we are coming from, where the stack at this level. So I just put a breakpoint when I receive the characters, then I go back in my terminal, I just it, and you can see that I've been stopped. I receive it, my character just here, in my buffers. You can find the A that I just type in, okay? And then I can just resume. We just do a little modification. We will trust, we will add just the traces. Nothing matter with the USB. I just show you how to, tie, to, to do um, a, a traces because it can be useful for your debugging. So, just a tips. Nothing with USB can be used for any other project, and we will use it sending traces thanks to uh, um, software, um, the interface software. So, here we come back on Cubemix, and we will use the debugging link for that. In the pinout, in the system, So I come back on CubeMX in my project that I haven't closed. If you have closed it, just reopen it. And then on the debug, I'll say, OK, I want to have some traces asynchronous softwares that it will use a link of the debugger to send the traces out of your STM32. So I just select Trace Asynchronous Software. And you can see more in your PC here the PL13 have been booked for this. So I come back in pinout, in the system, and in the system debug, here I just configure one pin to say, okay, I want the asynchronous traces going that way. It's okay for you, just this configuration. I generate the code again. If we have put our code at the good place, it will be theirs. So it's a good test. If it's not working anymore, that means we forget to put the code at the between the beginning and end flags. So I'm closing. 
Here I will stop the debugging. So I'm coming back on Hatolic, sorry. To stop the debugging, just right click and do a terminate and remove. That means, okay, Atolic, I finished to debug. Close the link, but also close the configuration for this debugging. That's prevent to have you many, many configuration debugging at the same time and could lead you in unstable configuration. Just doing that, you will remove everything and you come back to the C++ view. Okay, I can go manually to the debugging. There is no debug anymore, but here I'm in C++ view. Now I will come back on this file and I would like to do a traces each time I receive a characters. So I will go back on the top because I want to add it a function for that. So I found the good, yeah. User code begin private function declaration. That could be good to put it there, for example. So let's declare our debug function. We say, okay, this is a debug, right? The prototype will be a pointer on char. Underscore type. Then you get pointers. Ins text in underscore type. Then you've got the lens. So you can call it as you want, of course. And there, uh, I will just need to pass my pointers and send this to the ITM traces. Uh, int 16 type. Oh, sorry. In type. He. For e equal zero, zero R lens. Okay. A plus plus. Okay. Then I will just call this function etm sensor with this store ptr. Then we will return each. So just by defining a function, we just pass the characters, the, the channel character we send, and we just send by character by character on this debugging link. So this is just a tip, nothing to see with, uh, with the USB, but it's something that you may need on our platform sometimes. And then we will just call it and check the output. So I come back on where we transmit our, our code. And I will just do my debug right. Debug uh, right. And say cuckoo with a slash n, maybe it would be better. Okay, and just say that it was a uh, int 16 underscore type and say it was seven characters. Okay, I let you choose choose the message you want to see. Then just build the project and then you can download it on your target. <laughs> okay, sorry for the typo. Okay, build is finished. Then for downloading, again, debug as embedded application. So 
he has downloaded the code, I can launch it. And now we will need to define how to handle these traces. So you have seen that these traces have been sent to one pin. So for sure we won't see it on the USB port or something like that. We will use the ST-Link utility to be able to see these traces, okay? But for that, we have to unconnect the debugger because we have two debugging links, the one from Atolic and the one from the ST-Link, okay? So here we just remove or stop the debugging here by terminate and remove. That's not mean your device is not running because you flash on it, you can reset it and it was working. So just doing that and after just launch ST-Link. So So ST-Link utility is a tool that uh, allows you to flash your board, thanks to ST-Link, uh, to activate this view, the uh, trace view verb. Uh, it's mainly replaced by a new tool, which is a, a, a cube programmer. But in cube programmer, for the moment, we don't have the functionality of the software traces output. It's why we're still using this tool during this training. It should come very soon, but for the moment, it's not. So here yeah, we can see we've got some print f via software output viewers. It's exactly what we want to do right now. And here I have to select the clock. I already do the test myself, so the value is correct. But you have to set it there. Because you see, you only have one pin that will send the information and you have to be at the same speed as the, the clock of your device. So set the system clock to 168 uh, and 60 megahertz, I will say. Then once you have done this, just do a start. And then it should have been started. So if I go back to my real time, if I hit A, oh, again, <laughs> I should be at a good speed. Oh, I love the connection again, sorry about that. So here you can see that I've got some cuckoo in my serial viewers. <laughs> 